Hello, everyone. I hope you all got to have some coffee and also some snacks. One of the jokes we always make um, at our center is that we seem to always end up speaking about feeding immediately after everyone goes to eat and drink and then returns. So it's appropriate that we're speaking now. Many of you might have joined us yesterday for our extended discussion on this topic, and we'll thank you for your continued attention. Today we'll offer a brief overview of the most essential components of these interventions and some more details on common specifics associated with feeding difficulties and their presentation. Let me start by providing you some information about who we are and the work we are doing. I'm Mark Palmieri and my colleague Kristen Powers. We co-direct the feeding clinic at the Center for Children with Special Needs and that's in Glastonbury, Connecticut in America. It is an outpatient clinic where we provide services to individuals with autism spectrum disorders and their families to address feeding limitations. Those can be complex in their form and they can include anything associated with difficulties with food selectivity, diversity of a nutritional profile, having difficulty regulating quantities of food to take in, discriminating appropriate and inappropriate locations for eating, and all related factors. One important component to understand is that the treatment model is designed around what we call non-organic feeding issues. So those are going to be feeding issues that aren't better accounted for by an underlying medical condition. We ask that all of our patients be screened for those to ensure that any protocol we move forward with is sound and is respectful of any treatments that need to be completed before we initiate. So we'll talk today always about any non-organic issues that often co-occur in the presence of autism spectrum disorders. And we know that these are quite prominent within our community. There are few families who join us at the center, whether it's clearly for the feeding clinic or for psychological evaluation or other consultation where feeding has not been an issue at some point in their developmental progression. It's quite common and it's also quite often a challenge that goes untreated across the lifespan. So it's very common for us to encounter adults who have a long history of difficulties maintaining an appropriate nutritional profile and who haven't been allotted services to address those. So we understand that when we're talking about feeding difficulties, we're talking about not only their overall ability to take food in successfully, but also to do so in a way that is adaptive. So many of our speakers today have done a wonderful, wonderful job emphasizing the theme of individualizing programming, but also thinking holistically about the challenging behavior and the setting in which it is embedded. So if we're thinking about feeding, we will do that same justice and make sure that we are considering that any skills that are addressing feeding need to address the quality of life, and the social opportunities, and the various impacts that the entire system will have on that individual. One area that we encourage to be specifically, specifically included within any feeding treatment is an understanding of the oral motor competencies. It's an essential component of our clinic model that Kristen, our occupational therapist, have a comprehensive evaluation and participate in the treatment on our patients so that we're able to understand the structures of the mouth, the way the muscles and other structures need to coordinate in order to execute appropriate eating. So we consider not only will one take the food in, but does one have the competencies to manage that food? After we're done today and you all go to lunch, I'll encourage you to think back to this talk and try to think about the way you're eating. You'll tend to put the food in your mouth and then you'll process it and it will form a kind of ball in your mouth before you swallow it. If you try to eat on just one side of your mouth, it'll be extremely difficult. You'll, be, you'll have a tendency for your tongue to sweep underneath and to send the food over and to sweep underneath and send it back. If you, can't, if you don't do that, you'll find that eating meat in particular is quite difficult for you. You could imagine then, if you were an individual with an autism spectrum disorder who could not do that skill and had very poor communication ability, that you might choose to throw the meat across the room rather than eat it. 
And before I'm going to treat that you threw the food, I'm going to treat this competency, because if you had it, your challenging behavior would likely subside. So we take that approach very directly within our clinic and understand that in order to fully conceptualize this behavior, we have to know it from its smallest components within the mouth to its largest components around its entire community. These are some of the most essential oral motor structures that we find are implicated in feeding difficulties. We see difficulty with sucking, so the ability to form your lips around a straw and pull a liquid forward, your mandibular stability. You'll notice today when you're at lunch as well that you tend to chew and your jaw stays underneath you. Try chewing while your jaw's doing this. It's quite complicated, but also quite common for the patients that we treat. If you have decreased ability to organize the movements of your tongue, or if you're particularly sensitive to any of the touch, you might find that foods are very aversive to you. Again, before we treat your overt behaviors that are communicating that aversiveness, we're going to treat the underlying challenges for it. These are a set of the most helpful questions that we've developed. And I'll tell you, coming at it from the side of being a psychologist and behavior analyst, my occupational therapist partner has helped me to think about these as the most essential questions that I can put in my mind to understand the needs of my patients. So can a person achieve lip closure? The ability, think when you're taking soup. Can you close your lips and hold it and remove the spoon while the food stays in? Can you take food off of a fork? Can you move food, lateralize it from one side to the other and do so successfully? Do you have a mature chewing pattern? If you think to some of the individuals in your life who might struggle with feeding, you might look at them and notice an immature chewing pattern, which would mean their mouth goes up and down, but there's no rotation of the food. It's sort of a crunch and munch. We often see that presentation, and then with little surprise, our parents tell us their favorite foods are crackers and chips, things that you can put in your mouth and sort of melt away and very easy to swallow. You don't have to chew them very well. This makes good sense if all you do is move your mouth like this instead of doing any rotation within. So when you're trying to understand where are the core problems, these are helpful questions we encourage you to attend to. Secondary to those questions, we see behavior escalations, family problems, we see difficulties with broad setting events. So we have many patients who have seasonal difficulties with foods. As foods come in and out of season, they will change their eating patterns dramatically. As families move and vacation, they will change their patterns. As school starts and stops, they will decide what they would eat and what they won't eat. Those variables are all very important for us to understand because it's around those that we're able to shape behavior and adjust the way that the eating profile expands so that our learners can be more successful. Our model is a community-based treatment model. What that means is all the families come to us, they participate in treatment, and then they go home and practice. So that means this last point, that we have to assess the resources available in the home, is absolutely essential to us. I'm sure all of you have the same appreciation we do, that if an intervention is extremely complex and highly resource dependent, it can be perfectly crafted, but poorly executed. And that poor execution can more deeply attract a problem than it would have been without a more simplified intervention that progressed the family at an appropriate pace. We work very hard to understand that process with our families because it is the most appropriate way we feel to ethically apply a treatment that we expect a family member to employ. Imagine, for example, that I told you when you return home, you must change one behavior at home and you absolutely cannot move on with your life until you change it. If I were to tell that to a family of an individual with a feeding difficulty to say, he must take this bite and you can't move forward, bedtime would come and go, other children would go unwashed, school would start the next day, life will continue. So we have to have interventions that are appropriate to the family's resources and for us that's absolutely essential. We understand this process by executing a behavioral assessment. The assessment is designed to understand the function of the behavior. Like any other behavior, for example, the challenging behavior that Marco was speaking about earlier, we think about the function. Why is this behavior occurring for this individual? 
Are we seeing challenging behavior because of poor oral motor structures? And this is the way to communicate that challenge. Are we seeing it because of poor attention seeking or escape maintained functions? Why is it happening? Without that understanding of why, we will be shooting our interventions and hoping to arrive at the correct target. Instead, we focus intently on understanding that function. And these are some of the core components that we rely on in order to assess that. So starting at the least precise level of information collecting, we interview and collect information about the history. We look specifically at the patient. We directly ask the parents structured questions to understand the developmental history with respect to feeding. And then we do a clinic-based analysis of oral motor abilities and underlying function of the behavior.